hockey fans, are you ready to Brave the Wild? With me, your host, Paladino Joey, or Joey Awajan. Brave the Wild is available on all of your favorite podcasting apps and, of course, is a part of the Hockey Podcast Network. Dylan and Kyle, thank you so much coming in out of Vancouver, British Columbia for having me on board there. Lots of wonderful hockey podcasts, no doubt about it. Thank you once and always for downloading and listening to this show. It is a great pleasure to be back on board with you once again today. I'm back to being solo again, which is, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> but I absolutely love having Derek on. And what a great show they do as well over called uh, the, the Crease and Assist podcast. Derek, Kalisha, Teresa. Um, and it's cool how they have a rotation. Like, say, one person's not available. Then it's two of them. And then another person's not available. And then it's two of them. You know what I mean? Like, Derek's like the main host and all that, but uh, but in a lot of ways, it's like, yeah, if, if he's out, it could be Kalisha and Teresa. They do just a great job. Could be uh, Derek and Teresa. Could be Derek and Kalisha, which is like the main original group. But what a great job they do. So huge shout out and huge thank you again for a fantastic uh, uh, episode last week. And, you know, like doing the show together with Derek. And then, of course, great job they continue to do. Um, yeah, <laughs> just had to get that uh, in immediately. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Um Minnesota Wild, back to playing strong hockey again, despite an annoying loss to the Philadelphia Flyers. But they got a point out of it, and the Wild continue to roll. They continue to be in first place now, and Matt Boldy continues to score. It's the March of Boldy, no doubt about it. The March of Dimes, the March <laughs> of the Clouds, all that. This is the March of the Boldy. What number does Matt Boldy wear? 12. How many goals this month? 12. Incredible. A guy that not too long ago was like, okay, hopefully he gets 20 goals this year. He's, he's doing okay, you know, he's all right. He's developing. He's 21, you know. Yeah, we already gave him a big contract, you know, coming starting next year and all that. But he'll, he'll be okay, I hope. Maybe, knock on wood, he should be, you know, probably. The Wild made a decision to go younger versus uh, Kevin Fiala and all that for the similar amount of money for what Fiala wanted in the first place. Understandable, blah, 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 blah. Oh, um, now he's pretty much just like right, like a step away from 30 goals. So it's just like, that's that's what we're talking about. Matt Boldy certainly has been a wonderful story, a uh, revelation and all that good stuff. Uh, the Wild did lose to Philadelphia, like I said. One of those underachieving meh games, 5-4, to 3-1 to one victory over Chicago, which was closer than it should have been. But Alex Daylock kind of sort of stood on his head. Um, but thankfully, the Wild overcome that one. Uh, Seattle cracking 5-1 five, five to one victory flurry. Pretty much stood on his head. And then Philip Gustafson, phenomenal job against the Colorado Avalanche. The Wild win in Colorado, which in some ways, in some ways, at some points during the game, felt like a home game, which is incredible. Colorado? In Colorado. Yeah, there were that many Wild fans in Colorado. Now, a lot of people travel and follow the Wild all year or off and on during the course of the season. How you can afford it, I have no idea. But um, <laughs> more power to you. God bless you. I wish I could join you. I really do. I, 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 how you can afford it? I have no idea. And I know, I know. I'm, I'm not trying to be rude at all. Uh, I respect you. God bless you. And I hope you, it must be fun. It must be fun. <laughs> Again, I wish I could join you. I'm just jealous a little bit, if anything. I'm just jealous, you know. Let me, come on, bring me for free. Yeah, I'm, I'm the host of Brave of the Wild. I should come for free. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure, right? <laughs> Anyhow, it doesn't work that way, does it? Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, five to four, and I'm not gonna. I'm gonna try to make these shows more and more topical versus just review, review, review. But I'll review a little bit here and there when I'm solo. But um, yeah, I mean, I, it's it's a nice format to kind of be more topical than just kind of sitting and analyzing stats and all that, which I don't necessarily do either. I don't necessarily analyze stats all the time either. I'm sometimes some of those Viking podcasts over the years, it's like. You know, it gets too analytical, and you're like, okay, where where am I again? What planet am I on? I'm I'm I can't follow this anymore. It's too much. Now I'm being too much. Matt Boldy, of course, two goals versus Philadelphia, and again, the month of March for Matt Boldy has been unbelievable. He's now at 57 points, and he had no points last night versus the uh, Colorado Avalanche, and still it's 57 points. That's what kind of March it's been for our friend Matt Boldy. They fixed it. They fixed it. For the longest time, you'd open up player pro profiles on Yahoo and you'd just get a game log. And it's like, okay, can I just see their whole career? Like, come on, you can have a choice. The summary should be the summary. But yeah, the game log is always important as well. 
Um, yeah, he had a point in how many consecutive games? I guess Chicago Boldy didn't have a point, but then followed up with a hat trick. That's what kind of distracted it. He didn't have a point versus the Blackhawks. But my God, what a month of March it's truly been. Um, unfortunately, it didn't start well. <laughs> well, eh, it wasn't that bad. A 2 to 1 victory for the Wilds, so whatever. We won. No points for Boldy, but then had a multi point game versus Colorado. Or Calgary, pardon me. A couple of games with no points. Calgary, Winnipeg, two points versus the Sharks. Gets him to four. Uh, what am I looking at? Yes, that's a plus minus. Watch out for that. Um,. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Two points versus the Sharks. Goal and assist, four points. Uh, goal versus Arizona, five points. Two assists versus uh, St. Louis, seven points. Go, uh, assist versus Boston, that was a Ken, yep. So what is that, eight points. A hat trick versus Washington, that's 11. Uh, goal versus New Jersey, 12. Uh, two goals versus Philly, 14 points. 14 points. I hope I'm doing this right. I think so. Nothing versus Chicago. And then three goals versus Seattle. Three goals versus Seattle. 17 points. And that's why it's like, you know, 12 goals, five assists. Because he had the, the hat tricks. He had multiple hat tricks in, you know, just a few games there. Was it a few? Yeah, five games. A five-game stretch. He bookended it with, uh, no, six-game stretch. Bookended it with uh, two hat tricks versus uh, Washington and Seattle. Yes, I like to say Washington because I'm weird. Uh, again, nothing versus Colorado or Chicago. Two of our hugest rivals over the years, you could say. Though some would say we're not rivals. You know, those teams won cups and we're just, you know, we're just the wild. We've only been to a conference final once and we didn't even win a game in that series. And, well, odds are the wild will have home ice again in the postseason. It's time to put an end to that uh, drought, that curse, so to speak, that the wild can't win a series with home ice advantage. Because, yeah, remember that? Remember way back in 03? where we won two road series, you know, in set, we won two game sevens on the road and then couldn't win a flipping game. We like, oh my God, if we could take care of business on the road versus Colorado and Vancouver, surely, surely we could beat the Anaheim Ducks. They're only the sixth seed or seventh seed. We were the sixth seed. We have home ice advantage. I mean, we're going to the cup final. We might be playing the New Jersey Devils, who are insanely difficult at the time, and they're good again, but they were really tough back then. Uh, but we'll see. I guess we'll take our chances. Maybe, who knows? Um, but at least it's like 91 all over again. At least we might get back to the cup final again, which would be nuts. And then you get swept in a series where you have home ice advantage, and it's like, what the hell? Um, so, obviously, again, the Wild have been winless in home ice advantage situations. It's time to put an end to that once and for all. Um, and with a team like this, with this type of goaltending, uh, the overall defense, the timely goals by guys like Freddie Goudreau, who is a huge part of this, this past week, multiple big goals. Um, and I like his celebration, how it's so simple. He scores and then just kind of skates, skates, kind of skates by, kind of looks almost like he's kind of like, I don't know, breathing into his glove, kind of nothing too special. And, you know, just kind of calm, collected, and just gets the job done. I really like Freddie Goodrow. You know, it's hard to not like him. And he's had so many clutch goals for this team. Uh, and, and in the shootouts when nobody's getting the job done or there's just there's a lot of un annoying luck, good luck and bad luck in shootouts where he's just been consistent and sharp and solid in those. And when he doesn't score in the shootout, you know we're in trouble. It's funny how the Wild lost most recently the time that uh, Goodrow did not score in the shootout. So, But a huge week for Freddie Goodrow. That goal, you know, the the obviously big goal versus Chicago, big goal versus Colorado, and then the empty net, like, perfect shot from, you know, like, <laughs> basically almost almost across the entire rink. Almost, again, after making a nice block, and then the loose puck gets his puck, gets his stick on the loose puck and releases it, and it's just, yes! The Wild escapes uh, Colorado, despite a massive flurry against uh, Philip Gustafson. Gustafson. And the Wild Escape Colorado with a win. Just, mm mm. That felt like a million dollars. It, it really did. Matt Boldy again, 57 points on the season. Freddie Goudreau is not all that far behind. 35 points, 16 goals, 19 assists. Just a huge week. He's actually back ahead of uh, uh, Ryan Hartman again, who'd been hot. Ryan, Ryan Hartman's numbers are pretty decent considering the uh, circumstance, the terrible start, and all the uh, extensive missed time with the shoulder injury. I, uh, excuse me, upper body injury. No, you can't say that. No, I'm kidding. Paul Fend is no longer the GM, so I doubt I'll get my head cut off. But uh, yeah, he doesn't know he even know who I am, so doesn't care. <laughs> Philip Gustafson, 2.01 goals against average. Unfortunately, it's over two again. But yeah, you know, you know, we can forgive that, right? Things happen. 20 and nine on the year. 
uh, five ties, but that's actually overtime losses. I don't know why they have ties there, but that's from the old history, of course. Uh, three shootout or shutouts. Shutouts. Mark Andre Fleury, two shutouts, 2.81 goals against average, 24, 13, and 4. Those are overtime losses, of course. And you're hoping and praying, again, that this team does put uh, Philip Gustafson as the starter. But there's a good chance that whoever starts game one might not start game two, regardless if it's a good game or a bad game. That uh, Unless it's a shutout, so to speak. That's kind of been the conversation locally. Um, is that, uh, yeah, whoever starts game one probably won't start game two. This might be a real interesting uh, kind of back-and-forth situation, and the Wild have been insanely successful doing this all season, or at least, you know, two-thirds of the year now. Um, that's when the Wild started to play significantly better uh, several months ago. Um, so it's been a it's been a revelation. It's been a positive thing, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's not like, oh, you you, you got to stick with the one guy. You know, it's, it's how it works. That's it's how it works. you got to stick with one guy. Not always. Not always. And that was the Wild's mistake last year. Um it really was. You know, let, let's be fair about it. That was the Wilds' mistake last year. Uh, Philadelphia, yeah, I mean, I don't know, giving up five goals was kind of crappy, and it's Philadelphia. I understand they're kind of like maybe on some kind of a sugar high now, um, but then again, firing the GM shouldn't really give you a sugar high. Sometimes firing a coach that you didn't like can give you a sugar high. You either didn't like or just had lost interest in what he was saying, that type of deal. Um, Mark andre Fleury did give up four goals. Again, there was that uh, down the stretch. Uh, it was a yeah. It was one of those overtime shootout type of losses. It wasn't really five to four, but uh, four goals given up. And yeah, nobody scored. This is where Frederick Goudreau didn't score. And I remember just staring at the screen like this. Really, this really, Goudreau didn't score in the shootout. So that was insanely frustrating. Um, I'm probably in the minority, and I know I am. I love those Philadelphia uniforms, the black with their orange stripes. I think they're freaking cool. Um, I'm not a huge black jersey fan, but I like those. I like those very much. And I've heard nothing but, oh, they're boring or this or that. No, I think Philadelphia has some of the best uniforms in the NHL. And I think that's been the case for pretty much since the, the get-go of their franchise. And at least the Broad Street Bullies era, which were their original jerseys anyway, because they were not that old yet when that happened. Um, it's definitely been a snake bit franchise in terms of how successful they've been getting to the cup finals, but never winning the dang thing. Um, again, after the Broad Street Bullies, that was it. You know, they've been to the Cup Finals like nine, ten times since then and lost them all. Um, whether they run into a uh, new dynasty, an old dynasty, or it just didn't happen, whatever. Um, the Blackhawks, the Edmonton Oilers, blah, 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 over the years. Um, so, D D Detroit Red Wings, see, it's like one kind of dynasty-ish type of team after another. Um, at the beginning or the end. Now that I've babbled enough. But... I guess it's radio I'm supposed to talk. Do you want me to just sit here and just go like this? So, yeah, that's the other job. I think it's better to be quiet at work, but unless, yeah, I don't know. Unless you have reason to talk. Um, Freddie Goudreau did have the empty netter versus the Blackhawks. Ryan Reeves, fifth goal of the season versus the Blackhawks. I guess that's appropriate. Would have been nice to have Ryan Reeves back in the day when the Blackhawks were, uh, you know, they, they were the Colorado Avalanche type team in the NHL. They were the Tampa Bay Lightning the Pittsburgh Penguins. You could go on all day. Alex Stalock has been in Chicago the last two years, and he had a nice game. He was, you know, he's, he's, a, he's like a, you know, a poor man's Marc-Andre Fleury, if you know what I mean. You know, kind of the smaller guy who flops around but makes some nice saves. Obviously, definitely poor man's in a lot of ways. Uh, Lu Lucas Reichel, definitely uh, related to, uh, I believe it was Robert Reichel, former uh, Colorado. Uh, I keep calling him Colorado. Calgary Flames. Goodness, goodness. Calgary Flames, that'd be better. Um, a lot more likable than the Avalanche, I'd have to say, but, well, maybe not everyone agrees with that. This was a weird, low-scoring, kind of grinded-out slugfest, you could say, but the Wild did escape with the win, thank God, 3-1. to one. Again, you got the empty netter late by Freddie Goodrow, and yes, some of those goals, it's like, it's just an empty netter. Yeah, but it was huge. Empty netters, you know, like, wrapping it up. What if Goodrow missed? And luckily, what the, luckily the Wild were on the penalty kill because of a bullcrap uh, penalty on uh, Spurgeon. Maybe it wasn't bullcrap, but it felt like bullcrap. The way uh, it was some kind of delay of game type of deal where you're not supposed to put the puck up in the way up in the top and the you know top of the boards area. It stayed in the ice area, so that's what was very confusing and weird at the time, uh, non-reviewable and all that. So a lot of people are angry and frustrated which put the Wild in a very precarious situation versus Colorado as I bounce all over the place, but that's kind of how it is. Um, when I try not to just do review, review, 
um, and re- more like commenting and such. It, it, in a way, it was almost like, in a way, it almost kind of helped the Wild because then you don't have to worry about getting an icing anymore. Because um, obviously, Colorado with the empty net, and you might want to take shots at the net. And if you miss, you're in trouble. You know, you got an icing, a face off, and all that right down by the net and all that crap to deal with. But luckily, Goudreau's shot was like right on the button. I couldn't believe it. Um, better than the one versus Chicago. <laughs> it was a beauty. Uh, really appreciate what Goudreau has brought to this team. No doubt about it. Um, again, the Chicago game, nothing special, nothing to write home about, but uh, but a win. I mean, simply a win. It's not one of those obnoxious, like, stupid losses like Philadelphia where it was sloppy. This was like a, no, you guys aren't scoring nothing tonight. And that's pretty much what happened. Both uh, Gustafson and uh, Stalock faced only about 24 shots on net. So it was one of those type of nights. Uh, big clutch goal again by Ryan Hartman that got the job done versus the Blackhawks again. And again, that's where he's from. He's from Chicago. He wasn't born in Chicago. He was from further in the south, but he grew up in that Chicago area, did Ryan Hartman. So that had to be fun, no doubt about it. Seattle Kraken. This would be the feature presentation if that Colorado game wasn't as big as it was and the win as it was. be as a 5-1 to one victory over Seattle. The Wild went up 5 nothing. Poor, poor Gustafson couldn't hold on to the shutout uh, midway through the third, uh, thanks to Jaden Schwartz with his 18th goal of the year. But, oh well, it's like multiple uh, St. Louis Blues there. Schwartz and Vince Dunn scoring in that one. Well, you know, like uh, being a part of that goal to make it 5-1. to one. Jake the Snake Middleton would get his third goal of the season, just getting the puck on net and scoring. It was a good play, obviously, and he uh, felt so good. But then Matt Boldy with a natural hat trick follows that up. And Jule Chenek has definitely been keeping up with uh, Matt Boldy as uh, he's not relinquished third on the team in scoring. <laughs> Kaprizov still number one and still having fun. But uh, both Jule Chenek and Matt Boldy are going to be in 60-point territory here in the next couple games which is wonderful. Uh, Zuccarello has certainly been a lot quieter without his buddy, Kirill Kaprizov, his, his coffee buddy there, <laughs> coffee cup buddy, whatever, saucer buddy, whatever you want to call him, with still with 65 points in uh, 73 games. It's not like they're bad numbers or anything. It's just that I'm sure they would have been higher, and Kaprizov um, might have still had a shot at 100 points or at least upper 90s. We'll see how that winds up now. Probably he's going to be fighting for 80 points at best. Uh, as Kaprizov returns, which is okay. I mean, it is what it is. If you miss time, you miss time, and it was a freak injury. So, um, but to see Julia Chenag, Matt Boldy step up the way they have, Freddie Goudreau, Ryan Hartman, guys like that stepping up, Ryan Reeves, Ryan Reeves stepping up, um, everybody but Matt Dumba pretty much <laughs> stepping up in the point total, uh, point uh, department and all that. Matt Dumba still 14 points on the year. It's the darndest, craziest thing that Matt Dumba has been that invisible offensively compared to what he once was. And I know it's like you could beat it to death. Oh, where's Dumba? Where's Dumba? How come he's not scoring? Where's Dumba? Where's Dumba? But I don't know. Where is Dumba? How come he's not scoring? <laughs> but it is what it is. Uh, there's, It is what it is. The writing's on the wall. We all know what's happening. We just, we all know. Uh, Dumba will not be back with the Minnesota Wild. He just will not. He's going to wind up with the L.A. Kings. He's going to wind up with the Philadelphia Flyers. Uh, who knows? He was. He might go. He might wind up with Calgary. Might wind up with Ottawa. So, and Ottawa won't have to have given up anything. I know Ottawa's definitely interested. Uh, I believe the Sharks were. No, that was uh, Greenway. Greenway. Yep, that's the other guy who just stopped scoring. Um, but obviously, playing a forward role and all that stuff, you expect some scoring. Some. Not every forward is necessarily going to be a thirty-goal guy, but. Something would be nice. Um, Greenway check, yeah, one goal in eight games for the Sabres. So, picking right up where he left off. One goal in eight games. Mm, mm. 50th overall pick, by the way, in 2015. So, thank God for Jules Eriksson Eck and uh, um, Kirill Kaprizov from that 2015 draft. No, they don't talk too fast and mess up my simple English here. <laughs> 59 points for Jules Eriksson Eck. I mean, it's just, you know, what more can you say? Again, patience. Patience pays off. That's an example of patience paying off because, you know, early in his career, Jules Eriksson Eck was having struggle getting, was having struggle, was struggling to get 20 points. Some of those years, 58 points, or 58 games, 14 points, 62 games, 29 points. Oh, we got to 30 the next year, and then now 49 and 59 
respectively the past couple of years. Patience paying off. Julie, Julie Erickson Eck looks so good in that playoff series versus Vegas. Um, and it really has, you know, has kind of ha, has just been on a, on a solid pace ever since then, a solid uptrend ever since. Um, and this was on a team that wasn't scoring a whole lot of points this year early on in the season. Um, scoring a whole lot of goals, at least when we started winning games again. It was like two wide open at the beginning where we were losing games five to four, like Philadelphia. <laughs> that was kind of what it was like. And then we were winning every game two to one, two nothing, three one, two three nothing, two nothing, whatever. Um, not not all that that many shot outs, but a number of them. One one, one to one, and then a shootout win or something. <laughs> um, and then things had to open up a bit with Kaprizov's injury. And this is a this is a team that looks like they could go on a, on a playoff run with the uh, high IQ players, the strength, the grittiness. Um, the more the more focused defensively, and a team that just seems more primed and ready to make a playoff run, and hopefully, hopefully this never ends. Which I was uh, talking with Derek off the mic on uh, you know an instant messenger and stuff. Well, you know like Twitter. Um, so just an overall wonderful feeling going forward here with this team. Um, and again, Flurry looked really good against Seattle, where there were some flat moments in that game where it looked like maybe the Wild might not pull away in this one, but luckily Boldy has just been on an absolute mission, the March of Boldy. And then now, our feature presentation versus the Colorado Avalanche. And now, our feature presentation. You betcha. You betcha. Colorado Avalanche. The Wild go into Colorado and win and maintain first place in the Central Division. It's, I mean, I don't know. Even the most optimistic Minnesota Wild fans midway through the season, did you really think we would be here to, right now? Did you really think so? And especially with Colorado surging, even though, though Landeskog hasn't played a single shift all year. Thank you to my fantasy team, but at least we still have a shot of going to the final. Thank you, believe it or not. Not just because of Landeskog, but, <laughs> Landis, but <laughs> not like, yeah, Landeskog isn't the only reason why we had a weaker season, but um, whatever. Uh, Goudreau, again, the multiple goals. Again, that gorgeous uh, final moments, uh, empty netter. Really appreciated that. Um, incredible pass by Jules Eriksson for uh, Marcus Johansson's goal to kind of open things up. But, I mean, I, none of us, I can't imagine anybody listening to this right now or watching last night was comfortable until Goudreau scored that goal from, you know, way the heck out, way across the rink after, again, blocking a shot. And then there was a loose puck in the game possession and released it perfectly did uh, Goudreau it felt like Colorado could win this game easily, Nathan McKinnon was dominating in the faceoffs, 15-6 to six. Uh, the, Wild were lo- uh, the Wild, just about everybody had a losing record in the faceoff except Connor DeWer so it's like terrifying, like any type of a, a faceoff in our, in our zone late in the game with a 6-on-4 5-on-5 uh, uh, excuse me, 6-on-5, whatever it was before the Spurgeon penalty, which was like ugh which had Spurgeon flipping out going, what? You know, it was kind of funny. You don't usually see Spurgeon flip out that much because he couldn't believe what he was seeing and hearing. Um, but it was a scary moment and in a, a big, big moment, like, like a minute left against this team with these players and all that talent and how well Colorado had played. Their, uh, their uh, power play was phenomenal on a huge uh, st- streak, power play after power play, or at least every game. There was at least one power play. I forget what the actual streak was, so I apologize for that. Um, but the Wild broke that streak, and thankfully, again, it, Colorado had one last chance to uh, continue it by possibly tying the game up and you know, maybe with momentum winning it. Uh, but luckily, the Wild would uh, just maintain possession of the puck, and again, the release by Frederick Freddy Goudreau ended up being uh, enough to win the game. Oh, it was so nice. What a great week by Freddy Goudreau. Absolutely, I felt like a million bucks. Um, the Gus Bus is back full force. Strong play from Mark Andre Fleury as well. Not great versus Philadelphia, but nobody was great versus Philadelphia. But the Gus Bus is back full force, and of course we'll talk about that some more in the fan interaction segment. So I'll kind of sort of save that for that. But again, if I'm the guy in charge, I want Gustafson to be the goalie in game one. That's it. But I mean, I'll we'll have a more extensive conversation in fan interaction. 
Um, and again, we'll talk about the NCAA tournament. That's segment two and the prospects and such. So I'm really looking forward to that. The Wild are only playing one team this week, two games, and against the Vegas Golden Knights. So it's a preview of the Western Conference Finals, you see. It is. Well, who knows? Maybe it is, but <laughs> maybe. Maybe it's against Colorado. Maybe it's, uh, who knows? But I hope the Wild are there, and I hope the Wild win the Western Conference. And um, and uh, then we get to play some really tough, dangerous team in the East, and we'll see what happens. But um, <laughs> I am not predicting the Wild to go to the Stanley Cup Finals, or Final, Finals, Final. I like Finals better. Everything old-fashioned I like better than... The, Almost everything. If it's music, movies, video game, everything. Everything but laptops and cell phones, pretty much. I like the older version of it. Just about. Um, Christmas lights. I could go on all day. Christmas ornaments. <laughs> uh, just about. Um, uh, sports, too. A lot of times, I like... Yeah. I'd rather see Magic and Bird versus Steph Curry or something. Ugh. Yuck. You know? So, yeah. Would I rather see Gretzky or McDavid? You tell me. Come on. You know? Come on. As good as McDavid is, I'd rather see Gretzky, sure. Um, maybe I'm just a, an old, old head. But another fun week, again, points in every game, even the bleeping Philadelphia game. Not coming out with two points is really annoying. But you make up for it pretty nicely by beating Colorado on the road. And fans that showed up, you know, all those fans that went to Colorado, more power to you. Thank you. Um, thank you. That was, it, it's amazing. It really is. And, Hopefully it continues into the postseason, and we have a very, very fun spring here. It's nice to know that it is spring, even though it's still super cold for some reason, but uh, it just is, because maybe it's supposed to be cold this time of year still sometimes. But <laughs> um, but luckily the Wild continue to play hot and have all the opportunity in the world to make a serious playoff run this year. So, an amazing feeling. With that, uh, the... Mike Madonna Award winner for this week is going to go to Matt Boldy again. Honorable mention to Freddie Goudreau and Gus Buss. I mean, they have to be right there. So it's like if it's three stars of the week, Boldy one. Uh, gosh, Gus Buss two, Freddie Goudreau three, I guess. No, so if you want to do stars of the week, I might kind of start doing that. Especially if it's like you can tell there's multiple guys that deserve mention. Um, the James Shepard Memorial. A lot of people would probably go with Zuccarello. He's been, he has been kind of invisible. He's been quiet. Um, generally speaking. It's not like he was terrible, but it's not like he was good either. And there was kind of ongoing frustration conversation on, uh, I believe, Kree's podcast. They talked about it a bit. And I think me and Derek talked about it last week, too. It might have just been on their show. I'm kind of blanking in my head now because my mind is moving all over the place. Um, Zuccarello certainly has been quieter, insanely quieter, um, what did he have? Two points this past week, which, eh, it's, it's okay. Both assists. It's okay. Again, people are always saying, shoot the puck more. Well, yeah, definitely. But, I don't know, maybe that's just the way he is. Just wants to pass, 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 I guess. Make the fancy play. Um, Jewel Eriksson Eck, luckily, ma yeah, he made a fancy play, but he wasn't even thinking about it at the time. It was just the right time, right place, and maybe the only way to complete it was it almost had to be fancy. The kind of behind the back. And of course, again, the uh, <laughs> behind the back shot. Almost like posting up like a power forward in basketball or stenter. Uh, Sam Steele with that nice goal versus Colorado. Huge one. And uh, Derek was talking about that off the mic as well. About how Sam's, you know, that's what's kind of special about this team is guys <clears throat> can come in after being scratched for so long, you know, like you would call sitting by the uh, James Shepard Memorial popcorn maker. That was funny. I liked hearing that one. <laughs> Did you get the James Shepard Memorial from this show? Yeah, <laughs> maybe, right? Um, but no, yeah, he'd been sitting up there by that that popcorn maker, so to speak, and then back in, and he's there. He is, you know, there he is, scoring a huge goal against one of the best teams in the league and the defending champion and all that. So, huge play. So it's nice to know they have all these weapons that can get the job done. Uh, not stars or anything, but guys that can show up and play and. Connor DeWer, the reason why he's been on the ice all season is because, again, he's consistent. Consistent, and he is one of the best penalty killers on the planet, to be quite fair. He, he really is. Um, he's not putting up dazzling numbers like he might have been doing in Iowa, but he, he doesn't have to, to be productive and to be in the NHL. Uh, he has a special skill right now, and that's penalty kill. And also just generally a nice, awesome fourth-line player in Connor DeWer. So I really appreciate an unsung hero like that that could... Maybe help you win a huge playoff game. Maybe. 
You know, <laughs> you're just going to have a very strong possibility guys like that. Maybe score the game-winning goal in the cup final. Who knows? Um, but anyway, that's where we're at. We'll come back now. We're going to take a quick break. Come back for segment two. Look at Vegas and talk about the NCAA tournament and prospects and all that cool stuff in segment number three. I think you know what that is. Fan interaction. segment two let's look at the vegas golden knights who are still golden despite the injuries despite the fact that guys like uh, mark stone are oft injured despite the fact that it's kind of a weird team i don't know it's kind of a weird team very talented unfortunately the month of march is over in terms of the wild playing well uh, wild will play on the road in vegas on saturday april 1st hopefully it's april fools for vegas and not the wild and then uh, monday March the 3rd versus the Vegas Golden Knights, and then we won't have a game to talk about until next week with Pittsburgh, St. Louis, Chicago, Winnipeg. Oof. Interesting schedule at Pittsburgh. Those are pretty fun. That's a pretty fun matchup. It's a classic, and of course, that's where Bill Guerin wrapped up his playing career and uh, started his executive career before coming to Minnesota many, many, many moons later. The Vegas Golden Knights, the Vegas Golden Knights, of course, a lot of people love to take road trips to... Uh, Watch their team, be it the Wild, be it the Calgary Flames, be it the New York Islanders or whatever in Las Vegas. That's one of the uh, they're one of the beacons of hockey for that, and that's why it's like an easy sell to have Las Vegas in the NHL, and one of the smartest moves of all time, honestly. And it's a team that's easy to like, I guess. No, maybe not, but I like them. I don't know. Not everybody does. Uh, Logan Thompson's been oft injured most of the year. Well, not most of the year, but for an extended period came back and went out again, which is really disappointing for Vegas anyway. Riley Smith out for Tuesday, March 28th anyway. Uh, Shea Theodore day-to-day as of uh, late March. So it will not travel with the team, but, well, he'll be back. Or, excuse me, Vegas uh, will be back home anyway versus the Wild on April the 1st. Ryan Reeves actually missed Wednesday's game versus Chicago. Yep, or Colorado, pardon me. And he had some weird thing with smelling salts and all that, so he's been struggling a little bit. Uh, Brandon DeHaime was sick, unfortunately, Colorado uh, versus Colorado anyway. And Kaprizov, same situation going on. Yep, and it sounds like he's going to be returning to the ice fairly soon, uh, him being Kirill Kaprizov. But that uh, Gustav Nyquist, according to Bill Guerin on uh, Minnesota Wild Weekly, said that uh, Nyquist is actually going to be returning before Kaprizov. Before Kaprizov. I'm sure that's not a huge surprise. But it's a little bit. Uh, Freddie Goudreau apparently was the number three star of the night, according to NHL Network. That's flashing on the screen right now. Number two, Alex Lyon of the Florida Panthers, who lost to Toronto. <clears throat> no, they beat Toronto. God, I'm getting mixed up. Yeah, they did beat Toronto. That's right. It was a uh, yep, Sans- Samsonov, which doesn't help me in fantasy. Come on, Samsonov. <laughs> and uh, Brandon Montour, number one star of the night. So two Florida players getting it. Interesting. And then Freddie Goudreau, number three. Well, he definitely deserves the recognition that he got there. Um, Vegas. 13th in goals. The Wild are 22nd. Weird. We should be higher, but we did have that low stretch. 3rd in goals against for Minnesota. 10th for Vegas. Power play. The Wild are 14th. Vegas is 16th. Penalty kill. The Wild is 12th, and that was biggest penalty kill ever yesterday. 12th in the league, which was much worse earlier in the year. 19th for Vegas. Penalty minutes, the Wilder 29th. Still stuck in there. And Vegas is the best team in the league staying out of the box with only 522 penalty minutes. So that's cool for Vegas at the very least. As I suddenly have a coughing fit. And I apologize for last week. During, uh, whenever I have like a, a, a round table or, well, it's mostly just like me and one other person. Particularly on this show, that would be Derek. I, uh... Yeah, <laughs> it's harder to edit out the coughs, and I, I apologize. I edited out some, but I still left a few in there, and I apologize. And I think there's a better way I could keep them quieter as well. So luckily when I'm solo, it's much easier to do. Um, 
to, to do that. So again, I apologize. There's a nice nice button that looks like a, a sideways equal sign that helps you uh, edit out coughs really quickly. So <laughs> it is what it is there. The Wild are down one nothing in the season series. Vegas trumped us 5-1 to one most recently. Absolutely uh, stomped all over the Wild 5-1. to one. Jeez, I, I barely remember that one. But maybe that's why I kind of blocked that out. Nicholas Waugh or Roy or whatever it would be. Tenth goal of the year, Pet- Petrangelo. Seventh, Kaprizov, surprise. See, that's when Kaprizov was the only guy scoring. 29th goal on the power play. Boldy and Erickson, just the best power play line. One of the best power play lines the Wild have ever had, I'd have to say. Uh, Paul Cotty or Riley Smith had multiple goals. And Jack Eichel, who the Vegas Golden Knights gave up the farm for, if they ever had a farm to begin with. That's the one problem. And that's the frustration you'll hear on the sin bin is like, what farm? <laughs> what farm do we have? Okay, sorry. That's like the, the host, right? Uh, Ken, right? What are, you, what are you talking about? We don't have a farm. We keep trading everybody away. It's all about win now, win now, win now. No. <laughs> exactly. He's, yeah, he doesn't like that the Vegas Golden Knights don't build up something. And I would agree with that. Uh, Fleury got crushed and Gustafson faced uh, nine, uh, eight shots after that and didn't allow another goal. But that's how that went. Now that I've done reviewing that, get back to where we need to be. Uh, again, Mark Stone has missed a ton of games, and they're not really completely even sure what to say at this point. Stone was very efficient, very solid, and one of the reasons why Vegas was back in gear this year. Um, so he had 38 points in 49 games. Again, he's a great passer, great overall player, but the unfortunate fact that he's been missing, uh, that he's missed so much time. Um, I'm going to go back here. I apologize. Not back, but yeah, he hasn't played since January 1st. That's what I wanted to figure out. He'd been on quite a tear, except for the last two games there. Uh, gosh, he had points in like how many games? Like nine games in a row, three-point games, two-point games, Kaprizov type numbers in a lot of ways uh, for Mark Stone. But unfortunately, uh, injured reserve, you know, long-term injured reserve as of January. Uh, wonderful player, but Unfortunately, the last couple of years, it's just not been a, a, a pretty thing for him. Uh, again, Logan Thompson's missed a significant amount of time, but Aiden Hill's filled in really nicely. You could argue his numbers are actually even better. Uh, goals against average of 2.45. Jonathan Quick has had some moments. He did have a shutout. I, yeah, don't forget, Jonathan Quick is a member of the Vegas Golden Knights. Remember that trade? Uh, wound up with the Vegas Golden Knights at the very end there. 7-5 and five record, so they've definitely been supporting us because Quick is giving up 3.5 goals a game. Uh, where Logan Thompson and Aiden Hill are about two and a half. And save percentages is about uh, literally equal 915 for them. Jonathan Quick, 89.89.5% save percentage. So not a pretty thing. And Vegas had won four games in a row, though. Columbus, 7-2. to two. Wow. At Vancouver, 4-3. to three. At Calgary, 3-2. to two. At Edmonton, 4-3. to three. But then versus Edmonton in Vegas, 7-4. to four. Oof. Just got demolished, though. So. Jonathan Quick must have been in that. Oh, burn. Sorry. <laughs> I had to say it. <laughs> I know. But um, he probably was, unfortunately, for Jonathan Quick anyway. Yeah, he was. And he gave up a billion goals. Yep, he gave up six goals. Gosh. And then Br- Brassal came in and g- gave up another goal on only five shots. Just wasn't their night at all. Uh, any hat tricks? Ryan Nugent Hopkins with five points. One goal and five ass- four assists. Mm. Connor McDavid, three assists. Anyhow, um, but Vegas, obviously, there's still something there. Uh, they're still winning games generally, except for that. Hopefully, the Wild can have a game like that versus Edmonton and or versus uh, like Edmonton had versus Vegas. Um, hopefully, but I'm not sure what to think. It's it's a tough matchup. It's a very tough matchup. I think the Wild split usually in, in season uh, situations like this. If it's the Wolves or the Wild, it ends up being a split most of the time. I think the Wild, uh, well, I think the Wild do not win versus Vegas. Maybe we squeeze out a point. Maybe it's like four to three. The Wild get a point, like overtime slash shootout type of loss. Vegas versus Vegas. I'm going to predict that. The Wild get a point, but don't win the game. Uh, the most likely guy to score is Golden Boldy. Yeah, Goldy Boldy. Maybe he'll get his 30th goal of the season. Be uh, two goals or something, but I think Golden Boldy is going to score in Vegas, and then at home I think the Wild win four to two, uh, and the most likely guy to score is going to be Freddie Goudreau in, in that one. Um, Marcus Johansson. I'm going to switch to Marcus Johansson. 
Gosh, both of them have 16 goals on the air. Wow. Nice, valuable pieces, aren't they? Let's just be honest. But yeah, Marcus Johansson will score, and the Wild win 4-2 to two versus the Vegas Golden Knights. I should switch it back to Goudreau because, yeah, that guy, when he scores, we win, I swear. He's one of those kind of things. I think Gustafsson will be in net at home, and Philip or uh, Fleury will be on the road. That's my guess because it's kind of a back-and-forth thing. Wild lose 4-3 to three in a shootout or overtime or something, and then win 4-2 to two on Monday. So there's that. Now let's dance around and look at the <laughs> NCAA tournament. Uh, actually, I'll wrap up with that. I'm going to back up real quick here. Um, guys have been playing fairly well in the postseason. Like, uh, Ogren has been playing super well in the postseason, so good for him. Yes, strong play by Ogren. Um, five points in four games. And the playoff action is called qualification. So qualification, the like kid qualified. That's good. Well, they did anyway. Um, yep, three goals, two assists. That's nice. Very cool. In the qualification, qualification. Okay, sorry. He had 20 points total in the regular season for hockey. All Svenskan. That would be him being Ogren. As for Danila Yurov. Danila Yurov, if it ever loads. <laughs> no. But, yep, thank you always, uh elite prospects. Yep. He also in the yep, in the KHL playoffs, eleven games uh, eleven games and no points. Uh, well that sucks. <laughs> eleven games and no points and then a minus two and two penalty minutes. Well that sucks. But it is what it is. I'm not down on him at all. Obviously there's a skill level there and he's uber duber young. So I I'm not gonna be like, oh it's over. It's over. I'm also not gonna be dancing on the clouds thinking he's the next Caprice off either. So I don't know. He obviously plays a different game. He's not as much of a goal scorer. Kaprizov is a phenomenal passer too. Uh, don't forget. But and he also started out being a better, being more of a pass-focused player. Did Kaprizov his for usually his first year in every every uh, level. Every time he moved to the next level, Kaprizov would be more of a um, pass-focused guy, and then he became more of a, a scoring-focused player, goal-focused player. Um, so interesting. Up at every level. So every level he'd been at. In the past. The past. Yes. Let's continue forward, laddies. Uh, why am I going there? Damn it. <laughs> that was dumb. Um, I apologize. Come on. Now I can't even move. So, it's kind of like uh, kind of like the NHL 20 years ago. Guys couldn't move, right? Basically, uh, there we go. That's what I was hoping for. Who's Nadinov? Yep, he had 41 points in the regular season, 11 goals and 30 assists, and 63 games. But in the playoffs, six goals or six points in 10 games, one goal, five assists for Who's Nadinov? One goal, five assists. Again, more of a pass-focused player and a defensive player, obviously as well. I could see him definitely being a, a phenomenal player in the, on the on the penalty kill in the future. And again, a great skater, obviously, absolutely great skater, but certainly has more scoring ability than he showed early on. But again, he was obviously the other guy who was super young at one point, so you got to factor that in. Guys like, oh, uh, when you talk about Iowa and all that, they didn't really play all this week. They lost the game they played on Saturday, and then nothing since, unfortunately. Um, but they did get a shutout, and that was uh, McIntyre getting his third shutout of the year. So that was the good part, the good news. 2.93 goals against average, so Zane McIntyre getting his goals against average under 3 again, which is great. Um, again, tough start to the season, which brought that thing up to the moon, unfortunately. Patan continues to be the best overall player uh, on the offensive side, but in a lot of ways, the best overall player on Iowa. A 27-year-old, you know, young veteran, basically. The quad A type of guy who's played with Colorado and with the Wild, uh, Minnesota Wild. In the past, uh, Sweeney's not been around. He's been out again, which is disappointing. Uh, Simon Johansson's been taking steps forward. He now has 10 assists on the season, 11 total points in 50 games, 57 games, excuse me. But Hodgson O'Rourke, not necessarily factoring in the scoring, but more confidence, playing stronger. Uh, Sammy Walker's back in Iowa did not factor in the scoring. Beckman has been factoring in the scoring, generally speaking, with 23 goals, which is second on the team. In a lot of ways, he'd been the hottest player outside of Nick Patan, anyway, and uh, Rossi, who is, but who had had a quiet week. But then again, nobody hardly even played, so it kind of is what it is. Yeah, it was all you know. It was only like one game all week. So, but a shout out for Zane McIntyre. I mean, we'll take it. So nobody's really complaining about that. <sighs> shout out for Zane McIntyre again, veteran goalie, who would be like a super duper emergency backup. 
He's basically the third string goalie in the Minnesota Wild organization. Unless they believe that uh, Jasper Volstad is. I'm not sure I'd do that. I don't think there's any rush. Um, last week you heard Derek uh, talk about guys like uh, Marshall Warren and such. And I, or I think that's in Twitter, actually. But um, we'll get to that. And on his uh, his, his own show, Cre- Hashtag Crease Podcast. We'll get to that shortly. Guys like Bankier, Masters, continue to be so wonderful. Uh, wonderful stories. Masters, 65 points in 66 games. And that's a defenseman, by the way. Great story. 85 points for Bankier, so added another goal. Now 37 goals on the season. Mm-mm. He's been awesome for the Camelot Blazers. Um, Kyle Masters, who, yeah, he's on Kamloops as well. Yep, they're teammates now. They weren't at first, but um, yeah, I've got to love those Blazers. That's where Josh Pilar used to be. Is he playing? Yep, he, he, he'd come back. He'd returned after being out forever. <clears throat> but of course, he's with a different organization now, and he's been disappointing, no doubt. He's one of the more disappointing prospects this year. It looked promising last year, but disappointing this year. No doubt about it. Jack Perk, we'll talk about him shortly. Unfortunately for him, his team is gone, but fortunately for Minnesota Gophers fans, we live to see another day. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hopefully two more days, and we're going to be super happy very soon. Nate Benwall. Nate Benwall. <laughs> the Waterloo Blackhawks. Cool name. Obviously. The Waterloo. I like that. Uh, one goal, five assists in 14 games for that club. He'd been on the Omaha Lancers earlier this season. Um, traded in that level of play anyway. Carson Lambos, Carson Lambos, 48 points, a career high, but 10 more games, unfortunately, than last year. Though, good that he's playing more this year. He's not, he didn't miss the amount of time he did last year. The points are down, but the plus minus is on. The plus minus is, is like out of this world. 60? He's a plus 60. Plus, yeah, I just can't believe that. That's crazy. Um, definitely progress for him in, in a lot of ways, despite uh, the scoring has been a little lower, but he's certainly becoming a better and better player, and he's now 20 years of age, so that's a good thing. Could see him on Iowa soon. No question about it, and go from there and see what happens. He, he'll be on the Wild next year, you know. No, I'm kidding. I know. Uh, occasionally, I would make it sound like I'm thinking he's going to be on the team next year. If he was, if he was on Minnesota, it would be like a game. It would be, it'd be like a game. Like, oh, what the hell, you know. That's all I meant, usually when I'd say that. But uh, that probably won't even happen. Because you don't see Hunt or uh, Aurora skating for the Wild this year. So, nah, it's not going to happen. Unless it's like he's this phenom. Like, oh my god, he had like 10 points in 4 games for Iowa. Let's see what happens. Let's see what, you know, <clears throat> what the heck. But the odds of that happening are slim to none. Hunter Heights. Hunter Heights. Okay, yeah, it's French, not German. It's French. Yes, it is. Hunter Heights. 42 point, 42 games, pardon me, with with uh, Saginaw Spirit after having a slow start in Barry. Uh, 18 goals, 33 assists, 51 total points, still well over a point a game. And he is extremely young, turning 19 in a couple days. So you're coming up, turning 19 in a couple days. Good for him. <laughs> Regular Lorenz, again, that would be University of Denver. They got knocked out in the first round, and I'm totally fine. No offense to you, Regular Lorenz, or your family. Just uh, rather see the Gophers win it and all that good stuff. <laughs> Obviously, no offense. And again, nine points on the season. Young developing, you know, with Denver. And good, good luck. Uh, Milne has been stepping up a little bit with Iowa. Ten points, but nothing too much yet. Obviously, one of the younger guys there. Ryan Healy of Harvard. They got eliminated early in the tournament as well, unfortunately. Wouldn't mind seeing Harvard. Uh, eight total points in 34 games for Harvard during the regular season. Where am I? David Spachik. Spachik. 57 points in 58 games for the Sherbrooke Phoenix of the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League. You know I like saying that. Any any league that's got five letters in it, I'm going to say it all out. Quebec Major Junior Hockey League. Plus 53 on the season. Again, that's a big deal. To be plus 53, you're doing something right. You're not allowing goals. And, and the fact that... Uh, you know, you you were able to manage 57 points, which is a career high. You know, seven points ahead of last year. Great numbers. More assists. One more goal, but six more assists. A very strong season for the uh, Shearbrook Phoenix. Uh, David Spachik, right shot defenseman out of Columbus, Ohio, and son of Spachik of the Columbus Blue Jackets in the past, of course. Petrovsky, both of these guys were really good in the, uh, uh, what do they call that? The uh, uh, World Junior Championships. 
Uh, Petrovsky, insanely young, doesn't turn 19 until August 10th out of Slovakia. Um, 55 points in 62 games. Slightly higher pace than last year, but only slightly, and that's fine. We'll see him continue to develop for the Owen Sound attack of the OHL. Good for him. On to the Tournamente <laughs> and all that. Um, Michigan pounds Colgate 11-1. to What the heck was that? It seemed kind of close for a little while, and then it's just... I, didn't Colgate lead one nothing or something, or it was like 1-1 to or something like that? Uh, oh, no, I'm, or maybe I'm focusing more on the frickin' Penn State game. Uh, yeah, I hated that. I hated it. That's what it was, the Penn State game. Colgate, it was low scoring at first, kind of like Minnesota and Canisius, and then it was like, you know, bombs away, bye-bye birdie, or whatever you want to say. But Michigan, 11-1 to over Colgate. They, uh, they uh, yeah, they brushed their teeth very nicely and all that. Uh, yeah, I know. Um, Penn State, 8 nothing over Michigan Tech. What the heck? I wasn't even trying to rhyme. 8 nothing over Michigan Tech. It's, it's nice to see Michigan Tech back in the tournament. They were an old, bitter rival for the Gophers about 45, 46 years ago. Gophers uh, were favored heavily in the 75 championship game, and Michigan beat, beat them. But the Gophers also beat Michigan twice. Michigan Tech twice with uh, Herb Brooks and co. when they won their three national titles in the uh, 70s. And just a few months before I was born, the overtime winner by uh, Neil Broughton over uh, North Dakota in April 79, which was really cool. If, uh, one of the happiest moments ever. Um, <laughs> 8 nothing though, by Penn State over Michigan Tech. Penn State looked like they may have knocked out Michigan. Looked like they may have had it. Michigan ties it up late and then ultimately wins it in overtime, much to our chagrin, because I think a lot of us would have loved to see Michigan knocked out, but not meant to be. Michigan is in the Frozen Four in Tampa Bay, and it's the exact same logo that they had a few years ago with just a different year on it. Quinnipiac was the top seed in their region. They beat Merrimack 5 to nothing. More of a defensive-focused club. But still, you know, still scoring goals. They still managed nine goals in two rounds. Nine to one in favor of Quinnipiac, who was number one pretty much the entire season. So I'm not taking Quinnipiac lightly. And I have something to say about their Frozen Four matchup coming up. <laughs> A lot of people thought Harvard would beat Ohio State, but Ohio State said, yeah, good luck. Good luck with that. Ohio State scored eight goals. Eight goals. Harvard only had one. And so much for any 1989 championship game rematch for the Gophers, at least for Harvard being a part of it anyway. Harvard knocked out very early. Ohio State, again, couldn't seem to, just, just couldn't match Quinnipiac. Quinnipiac, strong focus defensively and scoring their timely goals of the 4-1 to victory. They enter the Frozen Four and will play Michigan in their bracket, their super bracket, whatever is what it would be. Um, Cornell. Cornell was the fourth seed in their bracket going against the defending national champion and like nine-time or ten-time national champion Denver Pioneers. Ugh. And last year was the year of Colorado. Colorado. You know, the Denver Pioneers won it all. They were the best team in the in college, and they won it all. Colorado Avalanche were the best team in the NHL, and they won it all. Hopefully, the, uh, hopefully Minnesota has a similar fate. Wouldn't that be amazing if uh, Minnesota and Minnesota won it all? Wouldn't that be great? But um, unfortunately for uh, Denver, uh, it's not the same year. And college obviously is what it is. Players come and players go. A maximum of four years for the most part, except there's occasionally guys that hang around a little longer. Two to nothing shut out in favor of Cornell. And they really stymied the next team, but we'll get back to them shortly. Michigan had three teams. Minnesota had three teams in the tournament. But Michigan's were all spread around, spread out for the most part. Good for Michigan. Minnesota, we were all smushed in the same bracket. Boston University, who's been a team the Gophers have had success against and a team we've failed against in the past, but a team that we've all known about forever. So we'll see what happens. Boston U over Michigan, uh, Western Michigan, the team the Gophers beat last year to enter the Frozen Four, which was a wonderful day. 5-1 to one victory for Boston U, and then a back-and-forth, just, you know, grind it out, you know, hard-working, two-to-one win over Cornell. Cornell just couldn't keep Boston uh, in check enough. They, I mean, to keep them to two goals is pretty freaking impressive. I mean, insanely impressive by Cornell, only giving up two goals in two games total, but unfortunately could not get to the Frozen Four. They did win a national championship, I think, or was it they just got to the Frozen Four? I think they won a national championship way back in the day. Yep, if I remember correctly, they're coming out of uh, New York. There's a lot of teams in New York. 
Uh, Quinnipiac is coming out of uh, Connecticut. So you think of like the Hartford Whalers and stuff like that. Um, I'm pretty sure Cornell did win a national championship way back in the day. I'm trying to pull it up now. I, I know they did. Almost certainly. Gosh, they've been around since, eight, that can't be possible, 1899. Older than the Govers have been around since about 21. Uh, Ithaca, New York. That must be upstate New York somewhere. Cornell University. They did win the championship. Yep, 67 and 70. Yep, that's what I thought. So the Govers were very much around and were very prominent during that time. But it's crazy to think the Govers hadn't won a national title until 74. And all those great Gober teams like way back in the day, they didn't win. Isn't that weird? Uh, Cornell is, you know, Cornell had been in there uh, had been in eight Frozen Fours, most recently in 2003. I thought it was more recent. I remember seeing them there. Yeah, that was the year the Gophers uh, won it all. Of course, uh, we didn't beat Cornell that year, did we? No, we beat Michigan, and the New Hampshire beat Cornell, and the Gophers beat New Hampshire to win the whole enchilada. Yeah, hopefully the Gophers can beat Michigan again, if need be. <laughs> yeah, Cornell, big red, big red. Big Red Freshness. The Big Red. Yep, boy. Who who do you think their uh, sponsor should be? Nothing freshens breath longer than Big Red. Okay, sorry. <laughs> big, big Red. It's a bear. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Enjoy that nice cinnamon gum there, guys. Um, but I, I like Cornell just fine. But Boston University beats them. And uh, in the super bracket, we know who's on the other side. The Minnesota Gophers defeat Canisius after falling down 2-1 to one in the second period, which is like, okay, okay, enough of this Holy Cross now. I don't want to see this Holy Cross. I don't want to hear about McGregor. And then guys going, ah! And the Gophers lose like 3-2 to two or something in some bullcrap overtime game versus uh, Canisius. And we're back to square one again. No, nope, the Gophers said, okay, enough of this nonsense. And then just went absolutely berserk. It was fun. It was enjoyable. It almost felt like we're, yeah, okay, calm down, guys. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, we, we won. Just You can stop scoring now. Save those for the next round, okay? Because St. Cloud's not going to be that easy. Uh, St. Cloud shuts out the defending runners-up Minnesota State with their first Frozen Four last year, crushing the Gophers which was really annoying as hell. And the year before, they beat the Govers in the Elite Eight to go to the Frozen Four, which was their first. Uh, last year was their second Frozen Four, and then their first championship game, them being the Mankato State Mavericks, who some of the fans, I mean, they're nice, but they talk too much. And I I, I know I've been kind of mean about it, like St. Cloud State and all, all them. I haven't really ever had a problem with the Duluth Bulldogs fans and their uh, the team or the fans, really. I've You know, they're kind of they're kind of like a sister team to the Govers in a way. Um, they already have three national championships, which is not that far behind us anymore. Crazy to imagine. Um, but some, sometimes St. Cloud, sometimes Minnesota, some of their fans talk too much, and that's what I got annoyed with. Now, I didn't realize Jay Bushy had, was it, a, was it his nephew or his son? And I deeply apologize now, because I remember Derek mentioned that last week, a defenseman um, with the uh, St. Cloud State Huskies, which is, that's really cool. So all the respect in the world. Luckily, the Gophers were able to survive it with a 4-1 to victory. Thank God. Whew. And again, showing that this team can, obviously, something Derek talked about extensively last week, and it's so important, because what was noticeably missing on the team that got our butts handed to us by frickin' Union, who hasn't been anywhere near any championship game or Frozen Four since, and probably won't be without some miracle again, um, what did we lack? We lacked toughness. We lacked, def- we lacked a, a, good, a good defensive core. That's what the Govers lacked. We couldn't get the damn puck away from uh, Wilcox, and it made Wilcox look like a sieve when he really wasn't at all. Um, and I was an idiot at the time. Uh, like, why isn't he stopping them? Well, because at that point, he was fried and fricasseed after all the times that Mike Riley and co. couldn't get the damn puck away. Union just kept attacking and attacking and attacking, and we couldn't get the puck out of the zone. Couldn't regain possession of the puck, and it was another goal by Union. And they had that four-goal flurry, that the Gobers just couldn't survive uh, from and end up losing. And, I don't know, had me cursing my head off losing to a team that had no business really, uh, I don't know. That team deserved to be there, to be fair, but the program had no real business being in any championship game or winning at all. I mean, I don't know. It just didn't feel like it, but it was their year, uh, unfortunately, which was so flipping frustrating. I'm probably annoying people the way I'm talking right now, so I apologize. Yeah, they deserve to be there, yes, but... uh, 
It just sucked being on the short end of that. And it was irritating watching a team that wanted it more. Clearly a team that wanted it more. And a, a defense core that was soft and unprepared. Completely unprepared and soft. I, I mean, that still sticks on my mind. I'm still pissed off about it nine years later. And I'm not kidding you. So when you look at the defensive core of this current Gophers team and the defense core of the 02 and 03 Gophers, we had the Paul Bartons. Paul Martin was there for both of them. Um, you know, Jordan Leopold, unbelievable. Uh, what was the other guy? Keith Ballard. He was so good. Keith Ballard was awesome. And even he played for the Wild. That was fun. Before, again, I think concussions kind of finally did him in, just like Leopold. Uh, Leopold didn't... Uh, Leopold didn't stop playing because of uh, an actual concussion where uh, Ballard did. It's like he'd already had enough and then he'd already had a, a bunch of them and then he had another one and then never came, just decided that's it. Where Leopold just kind of didn't come back. Like he'd had tons of concussions early in his career that kind of messed up his career, unfortunately. Those were with the, uh, you know, in the NHL with Calgary and such um, after looking so promising. But what a phenom he was. What a great defensive core the Gophers had back then. And there's a reason why they won the national title two years in a row and with guys like Paul Martin and such who just phenomenal defensemen and high draft picks and all that, Leopold and Ballard and all them. Um, we had Goligoski in some of those promising years, but he was kind of he was well, kind of by himself and all that. There wasn't as much wasn't as much uh, defensive talent as this team has. This team might have the best defensive core of all time, might have the best top line of all time for the Minnesota Gophers. So playing against Boston University, it's going to be insanely uh, interesting and a lot of fun. Uh, a real chance to win it all this year, despite the fact the competition is really tough. If the Gophers win this thing, it's going to be <laughs> it's going to be uh, well earned, let me tell you. Michigan, a lot of people would tell you, is the best team in college hockey. Uh, Quinnipiac was ranked number one all season. One interesting thing of note that i got to tell you, I've got to say it, Quinnipiac is undefeated. They have never lost in the Frozen Four round, ever. Unfortunately for them, they are winless in the championship game, though. Um, I believe this is only their third, if I remember correctly, I'm pretty sure this is only their third Frozen Four. Good, that came right up. All right. Again, they are the Bobcats coming out of Connecticut. Connect the Cut, Hamden Connect the Cut. I know, it's just some old kid thing back in the day. Um, yep, this is their, only the third Frozen Four. 2013, they lost. In 2016, they lost. Um, it was North Dakota, right? Yeah, the first one. Uh, or no, the second one. <clears throat> I don't know why everybody was rooting for North Dakota in that game. To this day, I have no idea why people rooted for North Dakota. Really? Like, why? <laughs> so, that one, I don't understand. I remember being kind of ticked off about it. Heck, I was doing this show in 2013. So, I've been around for both of Quinnipiac's, uh, um, you know, finals round, whatever. Like, final round runs and all that. Um, Brave the Wild's very old. <laughs> 2013, who did they play? The Yale. Okay, Yale, of course. How did I forget that? Duh! The Gophers were like, you know, like the f number two overall seed. We lost to Yale, and they went all the way and won their first championship and haven't been close since. <clears throat> Quinnipiac, though, was two teams in their first championship game. Quinnipiac lost to Yale, who made their miracle run. Gophers were number two overall. Quinnipiac was number one overall. Canisius made the tournament. Yep, that's the other year Canisius made it. Isn't that funny? Their uniform is kind of similar to Quinnipiac's, that kind of navy blue and gold. Cool. <laughs> kind of like that. Um, oh yeah, and, and Union was in that tournament, yep, the year before, the year before, the Gophers were like, oh, we're not going to be one and done this year, we're going all the way and winning, and unfortunately, we lost to frickin' Union after going all the way, um, but with that said, Quinnipiac is undefeated, we'll see, maybe they can beat Michigan, I'm not sure, I think most of us are probably going to figure Michigan's going to win it, and I think it's Michigan-Minnesota in the national championship game, and hopefully, and pray to God, the Gophers come out on top. Um, as for scores, I mean, I don't know. I like it. It's tough to predict. I do think the Gophers beat Boston University something along the likes of four to two, something like that. I call everything four to two, don't I? Uh, Michigan Quinnipiac. That's probably going to be like two to one, three to two type of game. Minnesota Michigan four to three. Minnesota national champions. Pray to God. But uh, that's next week, though. Next week, I mean, they, they, we have, we won't have played yet. That's the annoying part. So we'll talk about it some more next week. But I do believe the Gophers can and will win the national championship. And I freaking hope so. 
with that, uh, I think I've babbled enough, but I've enjoyed talking about the NCAA tournament. It's a lot of fun. Uh, the hockey tournament is so much fun. Uh, the basketball Final Four is coming up, and you know what? I didn't even... Gosh, I'm so dumb. <laughs> I didn't even do the uh, DraftKings uh, deal, so now's the perfect time to do it. I will do it right here, right now. The biggest tournament in college basketball is underway, and the action is getting started on DraftKings Sportsbook, one of America's top-rated sportsbook apps. Right now, new customers can bet just $5 on any pregame money line bet and score $150 in bonus bets if your team wins. Well, hopefully it's Florida Atlantic. I hope. Plus, combine multiple bets for a shot and an even bigger payout. DraftKings will be featuring parlays and odds boosts all tournament long. So be sure to check the DraftKings Sportsbook app every day to see what they have in store. Well, you got the Final Four coming up. Now I'm losing my mind. Which is obviously very exciting. You got Florida Atlantic tipping off against uh, San Diego State, of course. We're really looking forward to that. Uh, Brian Dutcher, son of Jim Dutcher, the former Gophers coach back in the day, and a lot of people heard conversations and rumors about uh, the Gophers could have hired Brian Dutcher. Oops. Yeah, yeah very easily, and we didn't because that was so that was really dumb. Um, then you have UConn, which I really don't want to see win, versus Miami. The Miami Hurricanes of basketball in the frozen, no, in the hardwood four, the f- final four in the uh, college basketball world. Hoping for Miami versus Florida Atlantic or even, of course, San Diego State. I think that'd be really cool. It would be really cool to see anybody but UConn win. Uh, UConn's got four national championships, and I don't know, I don't care about UConn at all. They might not be North Carolina, uh, Kentucky, Duke, all of them, but I, ah, but they're one step below them. I don't want them to win, so hopefully it's one of the other three. Uh, Florida Atlantic, great story, no doubt about that. Um, back where I need to be, though, Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and sign up with code THPN. That's right, THPN, not XXX. So I have a huge apology here to my uh, the, the Hockey Podcast Network. So it really is THPN. Right now, new customers can bet $5 on any pregame money line bet and get $150 in bonus bets if your team wins only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code THPN. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes. For details. With that, we'll take a quick break and return for fan interaction. And we are back here on Brave the Wild. At Brave the Wild is the Twitter account. At Brave the Wild is the Twitter account. Hashtag Brave the Wild is where you want to go. No doubt about it to get into the conversation and such. So whenever you comment and you want to be on the show, hashtag BTWMN. Very important. And for Crease, uh, crease and Assist, it's hashtag Crease Assist. Uh, excuse me, Crease Podcast. So try not to mix them up. If you want to have us both uh, talk about it on our, on our different shows, go ahead. I mean, I'm I'm okay with that. Uh, I'm guessing Derek is as well. So, I mean, yeah, if you want to have your comments run on both shows, I mean, I don't think any, either of us are going to be annoyed with that idea. I'm fine. You know, you can hear our different points of view. And, well, it's fun. <laughs> so I was hashtagging this one from Michael Russo. No context still for Nyquist. This was uh, about a week ago. So still a ways away, but good sign he's progressed to practice. Derek Felska putting out that classic... Uh, Putting out that weekly poll, I think those are awesome. I need to do that more often again, too. And then he includes uh, us in there, which is really nice. Hashtag Crease Podcast, hashtag BGWMN. Yeah, and if I create a poll, I'll probably do the same thing. Yeah, because why not? <laughs> um, who is the Minnesota Wilds ideal, uh, ideal, meaning our best chance for a series victory first-round opponent, assuming we make the playoffs, and we should. Uh, the Avalanche, the Kraken, the Stars, or other. So first place, the Kraken dominate 64.8 and i agree with that i I clicked on that one seattle kraken are an ideal matchup i gotta think colorado for some reason people are well yeah i mean the other choices are colorado and dallas and we've you know not that easy of a team to beat uh colorado's in sec uh third other was 18.5 like maybe winnipeg i'm guessing that because that's a possibility uh colorado 9.3 dallas uh, most uh the team team we most like to avoid, apparently, 7.4. Cool. James Shepard, A.J. Thielen. Okay, yep, this is Derek Felska. The lightning round has begun it. 
Let me know if you like that soundbite. If you think I could do a better one, let me know. Maybe. Yep. Uh, that one's okay. I, I hope it's decent. Um, James Shepard, A.J. Thielen, Tyler Kuma, and Philip Johansson were all first-round figures by the Minnesota Wild. What video game that you purchased was the biggest disappointment to you, much like the selections were for the Minnesota Wild? Okay. Are you ready? Are you ready? I think I have it, like, right away. Because uh, I was very... Well, there's two of them. There's two of them. I might have to decide between one. Well, I ranted big time about one, but one I'm going to throw, I'm going to open up with. I might not have as much of a rant, but I just didn't like it. Just didn't like it at all. Final Fantasy VIII. After playing Final Fantasy VI, uh, which was, I think, about as good a game as you can ever make, ever. Super Nintendo. Final Fantasy VI, known as Final Fantasy III in the United States. But a lot of uh, experienced gamers know that it's actually Final Fantasy VI. That came out in 94. Um, and then Final Fantasy VII, I thought, was insanely good until they killed off Aerith, and then it was pretty disappointing. But still a very good game overall. So then you follow it up with Final Fantasy VIII, which was like, okay, that's cute and everything. It was kind of like, I don't know, Leonardo DiCaprio and, uh, what's that other girl? Jennifer Love Hewitt. Like, uh, I don't want to see this crap. Get out of here. It was just too cute, and I didn't like it at all. Didn't like it at all. The gameplay wasn't all that great. Um, that was a huge disappointment. A massive disappointment for me, though. I think it was probably even bigger just because how great, how great Lunar the Silver Star was for the Sega CD. Lunar the Silver Star for Sega CD. Remember, I'm going to keep repeating that because you you got to understand which one I'm talking about here. That was a top five Route Rushmore RPG slash video game of all time, in my opinion. The one that came out in 92, 93 for the Sega CD. Lunar the Silver Star. And that's the end of the the uh, the name of the, the name. There's no story, okay? That's the Lunar the Silver Star. <laughs> and then, years later, around 99, they came out with Lunar the Silver Star Story Complete for the PlayStation. Six, uh, significant upgrade in terms of technology from the Sega CD, which was a primitive CD system at the time. You could have more audio, you have more space, you have more this, you have more that. The video quality looked really good. You have more space. You can even add more to the game, this and that, or just have, and then the music quality will be probably stronger and better. And then they changed the music completely. They take the story and they put it in a blender. They changed the story too. It was very similar, a very similar story, but they kind of messed it up. And they changed the gameplay completely. Where an, an RPG, you're out on the overworld or in a level, whatever, a cave or dungeon or castle or whatever the heck it is, and you bump into random enemies, right? Up battle time. If you play turn-based RPGs, you know what I'm talking about. Um, in that one, you can see the monsters, which is cheesy and lame for like, you know, like people that begin playing RPGs. Again, they completely ruined one of the greatest soundtracks of all time. Changed it. So that to me is, yeah, that fits in perfectly with massive a massive failure. Uh, biggest disappointment of all time is Lunar the Silver Star Story Complete for PlayStation. I wanted to take it and break it, but I can't because it's actually worth some money, I'm sure, so I won't do that. Next, thank you. That was an awesome question, Derek. And, um, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I, that was it. <laughs> Derek Felska continues. The Derek Felska night lightning round continues. Will the Iowa Wild make the AHL playoffs this year? At the time of this tweet, the team sits in fourth place in the Central with 72 points and two games in hand on Rockford, who is three points behind them in the standings. I think so. I think so. I, I like the way they've been playing, generally speaking. I, they certainly haven't been world beaters, but generally speaking, they've been playing well, and Sammy Walker's back, much to his chagrin, I'm sure, but at the same time, you know, he has more opportunity to actually do something instead of, you know, being in the press box or fourth line or whatever the heck he'd be on. Um... Because, well, a a after the trades, now there's no room, which is, you know, it is what it is. Um, and hopefully, you know, Walker can uh, regain some of that magic he had earlier in the season. So I would say yes, that the Iowa Wild make the postseason. Here it goes, Boston Bruins. Yep. Eric Belska continues, says, will the Boston Bruins break the NHL record for wins and points this season? If so, how many wins and points will they have? If they won't, who will beat them uh, from this goal? Who will beat them to keep them from the goal? That's a tough one. So apparently the team with the most wins of all time was 62 by the 95-96 Detroit Red Wings, and they lost. Remember, they lost to the... 
I don't think, yeah, they didn't even get to the final, did they? No. They lost. 96 was Florida versus the Avalanche, right? So they made a loss to the Avalanche, or was it real early? I know they had some huge losses. Um, oh, yeah, Tampa Bay, 19. Yeah, and they lost, too, remember? 1819. They lost, too, in the first round to Columbus. Gosh, that's the one thing. So Boston, they might get knocked out early. They might, which is really lame. Um, wouldn't that be lame? Uh, as for the team that could knock, that could beat them, knock them out, uh, give me a second here. And the talk is, yeah, the Bruins are on pace for 63 wins, basically their record and everything, their current record and winning percentage and all that. Um, so they're on pace for it. As for who might knock them out, now that i got the remaining schedule, i got Columbus, who's the team that knocked Tampa out. That's the last game in March for Boston. Pittsburgh, St. Louis, Toronto, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Washington, Washington, and Montreal. Uh, they need to win six more games to get it. So, six more games to get it. Um, mm -mm -mm. Wouldn't be surprised if Pittsburgh beat them. Uh, I think they'll take care of business versus Columbus. For their 58th win, St. Louis, you never know. Toronto, well, historically, Boston's own Toronto. Uh, New Jersey could be a problem. Philadelphia's weird. I think they get it. I think Boston gets it. Yeah, I mean, you look at Philadelphia, Washington, Montreal. They need to win six more games, and they have eight remaining. <sighs> okay, well, they might end up tying. They might end up tying. Because Pittsburgh, New Jersey. So if they don't get it, Pittsburgh, New Jersey, and then maybe a weird one like... Uh, like a weird game, like Philadelphia. It just don't show up for some reason, something like that. But Pittsburgh, New Jersey are the teams that could keep them from actually getting it. That's where I'm standing with that. But I think they, I don't know, I think they get it. It's going to be tough. Maybe they wind up tying. I think they're going to tie. Yeah, I think they're going to tie. Long story longer. So we'll see. <laughs> it's going to be interesting. But that's the team, though, that will, yeah, those are the two teams, New Jersey and uh, Pittsburgh, possibly. But we'll see. Um, ooh, here's a cool one. What is the coolest... This is Derek again, of course, lightning round. What is the coolest item of hockey memorabilia that you own? It can be sentimental value or uh, monetary or just because you're proud of it or whatever. I don't have a whole lot. Um, I do have a small jersey from way back. It's actually... It wasn't mine, of course. It was given to me free from a, a friend in school many years ago in... Uh, the early mid nineties, the the mid nineties, like when I was in ninth grade, it was already too small for me, but um, it was like a replica jersey from way way back, like early eighties, late seventies North Stars. So that's probably my favorite piece of hockey memorabilia that I own. It's it's like an old beat up thing, but it's like if if say my mom were to be bored with it, you know, because it's still at my parents' house, it's still sitting there, been there for years, in the closet, my my old closet there. Um, if it's if she ever decides to give that away, I'm gonna be like, no, 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 you know, I'd be, I'd be, that kind of thing could happen. But um, it's because it's, you know, something like that is literally from back then. You can tell it's from that far, that far back, like at least like '85 ish. Um, I don't know if it was the guy's dad's when he was younger or what, because unless he has a much older brother, because I don't know. It might have been his dad's like in the '70s or something, like way back. That's just my guess. It's it's hard to say, but that is a very, very valuable piece of memorabilia. Otherwise, my white jersey, my white, my original white uh, Minnesota Wild jersey was signed by multiple players. Uh, if I remember, one of them was Brent Burns. Brent Burns, yeah, who's uh, like a Hall of Fame talent. So that's a big thing as well. I have multiple uh, signatures. I also got a hockey stick, like a little, you know, the little plastic goalie stick for the wild that you could buy at the, uh, taste of the wild or whatever it was that they would do every year. And that was signed by four players. Maybe that was the, maybe that was Brent Burns. I can't remember now, but I know how I had to retire that white Jersey cause it got signatures all over it. So I was like, Oh, Oh, I gotta hit up. So, <laughs> so those are three pieces of memorabilia that are just incredible. Um, that I, you know, otherwise, it's like, you know, I have, I have a Lou Nanny card that was signed, which is really awesome. And I got to meet him. And there's nothing like that Lou Nanny voice. I said, thank you very much. He said, you're welcome. You know, <laughs> he is a class act and a legend. Oh, what a cool human being. Like, you, you, you meet him and it's like, you know, that's Lou Nanny's Lou Nanny. He's not, he's not nice in front of the camera. And he's like, get this, get the hell out of here. I'm busy. Uh, get out of here or something. They're just bored with you. So, anyhow, I better keep moving. I'm dragging this 
Uh, Derek Felska says, Super 70s sports suggests including 19th century bicycles to make baseball more interesting? Huh. What off-the-wall suggestion would you make for hockey to make it more interesting? Um, 19th century bicycles. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> off-the-wall suggestion to make it more interesting, huh? Uh, maybe Jason masks. Maybe like Jason mask giveaways on like if there's ever a Friday the 13th, like whatever month it is. That might be off-the-wall type of thing. Otherwise, the sport itself, maybe have goalies wear those sometimes if it's a Friday the 13th. I, I don't know, but maybe not. Or at least like a like a uh, a mask that kind of has it on there. I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy. That's way off the wall. I know, but it's you know it's it's, it's the Jason mask, the '70s looking uh, goalie mask, or '70s and early '80s look. There ain't nothing like that. Jason Voorhees, Friday the Thirteenth. Yeah, that's one suggestion I might have just for the heck of it. Uh, yeah, that's kind of what I'm leaning to at the moment. Because I, I don't know. I don't know. If something comes to my mind before I'm done here, I'll keep I'll come back to it. Oh, here we go. This is where Marshall Warren was brought up. Derek continues, Prospect Marshall Warren entered the NCAA transfer portal. Is the transfer portal a good thing or bad thing for college sports, hockey, or otherwise? It can be a pain in the ass, but sometimes it's good for the player. You know, maybe they want to go to a different location and maybe they'll play better. I think it's good for the individual players. It can be depressing and a pain in the ass for the uh, program, I'm sure. But uh, if you're looking at the player, yeah, maybe he'll have a chance to do something. I thought he was a senior, though, so I'm really confused by that one. Um, Stephen Miller responds, says, in this case, he has an extra COVID year, that's why, of eligibility after four years of Boston College. He uh, gets to extend his college education. A uh, few interesting names chose to leave early, which I think fits your query. Red Savage left Miami. For MSU. Isaac Howard left UMD for MSU. Yep. Minnesota State University. Yep. That'd be the uh, the Mavericks, of course. Cool. Cool conversation there. Uh, I have a response to the Frozen Four thing. Derek Felska says Michigan looks really dangerous, but Penn State gave them a pretty good run for their money. Yes, they did. I still think they will beat Quinnipiac. Minnesota looked pretty comfortable against St. Cloud State University. Lacombe's heating up is good. A good sign for them. All Big Ten final. He was awesome, wasn't he? McCall made that huge goal that put us in position to win that uh, game. I was saying Matt Boldy didn't have 20 goals when Kaprizov was injured. Now he's a shoe in to get to 30. Incredible. Uh, Derek responds with, they say necessi necess necessity, yes, is the mother of invention, but it also can be the mother of assertiveness too, because if not him, who else would it be? Yeah. My, uh, um, Ryan Reeves. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Mike says, uh, yep, Mokov Mike says, uh, one thing for sure, if it wasn't for him right now, makes me wonder where this team would be in the standings. Yep, Derek says, no doubt. Uh, Dave, 1420, Dave D, 1420 says, growing up in my house, growing up in my house, <laughs> I'm just kidding, mother was the necessity of invention. You had to get creative with that smart woman. Uh-huh. Derek says, I think I understand what you're saying. My mom was a teacher. She knew kids and people pretty well. Yep, where you could read them and figure out, ah, I, I know you're hiding something, so you better you better admit it right now, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, my mom could be that way too. Anyhow, if I did anything at school, whether I, I was in the same school or, or she was at or not, she knew about it before I got home. See, yep, I know you're hiding something. Just, just tell me. Like say I'm not supposed to have video games right now and I'm hiding the Game Boy under the couch. So when she's not looking, I'm going to pull it out and yeah, yeah, yeah. Because let's say, let's just say there was a time in my life I didn't have good grades and I wasn't supposed to have video games. So yeah, there was a time my grades were not too good. So with my intellectual ability, you, you know, that's hard to believe, isn't it? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, Jay Bushy. Yes. Love to hear from Jay again. Who does the Minnesota Wild start in net for game one of the playoffs? And I'm really hoping for Philip Gustafson. A lot of people think it's going to be end up being Flurry, which you know, like the Declans and all them, believe that's a possibility. I'm sticking with Gustafson though. I I think they're gonna I think they're gonna wise up because it's plain as day. He's the guy, isn't he? It's got to be. Tom Hayen jumps in and says, "Yep, unless he is arrested for streaking through Mall of America, it's going to be." Mark andre Fleury. Okay, well, and it might very well be. <clears throat> yeah, see, here's the quote. We feel confident in both goalies, but Flower has been through the intensity of playoff hockey many times. Yep, that's the quote. Is what will be the talking point? Yep. Well, I mean, it probably is, isn't it? 
And Derek says, we said as much in our last episode. Yep. Yeah, I want it to be Gustafson. I really do. But you're probably right. You're probably right. Uh, yep, and then there was some back and forth friendly conversation between myself and Derek when I was saying how, um, what was I saying? Yep, I was saying, yep, Derek was having, like, uh, check out our latest show. And I was saying, what an awesome show. You guys deserve so much credit for what you have created. Yeah, and like I was saying, how they can rotate and such. Um, Derek, Kalisha, and Teresa. It rolls right off your tongue, doesn't it? Uh, oh, yep, their names just roll right off your tongue. Derek says, thanks a lot. Yep, thanks a lot, Brave the Wild. I feel like we are on the right track with a lot of things. But, of course, we wouldn't be here without your help slash advice as well as a lot of good examples to follow, like your show. Yep, thank you so much. Uh, three in a box. The Soda Pod, Beyond the Pond. No, Beyond the Pod, not the Pond. Yep, that one's good too, but yeah, Beyond the Pod's a little better. And others, hashtag Stick Cap. And yep, Stick Cap back, back at you. Sounds more like... Da, 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 da. Yeah, they do that on Soda uh, on, on uh, Beyond the Pod. At times, there's a quote response. I was saying you're always welcome. Thank you so much as well. Brave the Wild definitely grew and improved thanks to you. And it did. Um, a lot of these people like the Jay Bushies, the uh, Brian Herreras and such, I probably would have never, I may not have ever met you. So some of you I may have met anyway, but some of you I probably wouldn't have. And like like Tom Han and such. There's always a chance, but you never know. Um, there's always a chance, but you just never know. That's the thing. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. Because, you know, it's a big hockey peanut community. But Derek coming along definitely has been a huge piece to this show improving. I'm not kidding at all. Uh, Brian Herrera, there he is, says, What video game do you think is like Boldy season so far? Um, it's almost like Final Fantasy VI in a way. Because that game is, starts off very slowly. Like, very slowly. And then you're just like, whoa, this is really good. Wow. It starts off very slow. Like, the first couple levels, it's like, okay, can we get on with this? It's kind of like slow and... Too much dialogue and back and forth. Um, but that's kind of what type of game we're talking about. A game that starts slowly and then just boom. Like, oh my god, this is so cool. FF6 is the closest thing I could think of at the time. Again, that one started a little faster than, say, Boldy did. But let's just say, again, it is kind of like that. Kind of slow starting out of the gate. And then finally, here we roll. Final Fantasy VI. And I believe that wraps things up. So thank you, Brian, Jay, Derek. Uh, Steve Miller, you guys are phenomenal, and some others, um, Mike, yep, so that should wrap up Fan Interaction, major shout outs to MNW Prospects slash MNW Young Guns, Pavel Bennett coming out of Chechia, um, Merrick Skyba, um, Justin Baki of Sound the Foghorn Podcast, Brandon Quast, just a great guy, you know, coming out of Wisconsin, you guys are awesome, keeping up with the wild, the prospects, absolutely phenomenal job. Love what you do. I, I really do. And I'm saying that with full sincerity and, you know, really proud to be a part of that, even though I've been invisible and I'm sucky. Um, but it is what it is, <laughs> unfortunately. As for uh, other shout outs, Minnesota Wild Global, Scott Cavendish, Kathy Main, Michael Fick, Chad Walski, David and Chance Kostick, who are some of the travelers that follow this team, you know, uh, David Abraham, uh, yep, I met, yep. But yeah, the, the two caustics, you know, of course, they're, we're related with my brother. Obviously, his, uh, David is, uh, my brother's, uh, father in law, and then Chance is, uh, my brother's brother in law. So, um, but massive wild fans and going back into the North Star days and all that. And, um, yeah, it is, it is, uh, yep, the way they follow the team, it's, it's pretty much unmatched. And the wild really appreciate you. I'm sure they do. And, it's nice to hear fans cheering when the Wild score, even in Colorado, of all places. Pretty cool stuff. Um, another major shout-out, Patrick Turner coming in out of Florida. A lot of people from Florida. Minnesota Wild Nation. Thank you so much. Uh, really like, really love you, uh, Patrick Turner. Awesome guy. Awesome guy, no doubt about it. Um, thank you guys for allowing me to post, uh, basically, like, shout-out, like, hey, the show's out, you know, stuff like that. So I'm more than happy to give you a huge shout-out on this show. And thank you always. Um, the show has been so it's been doing well. It's it's not like exploding or anything crazy. There's a lot of 
you know, there's obviously a lot of Minnesota Wild shows out there, so it kind of is what it is. Um, <laughs> I'm not, it, it, it's hard, you know, there, there's redwoods, there's weeds, there's redwoods, sequoias. I'm maybe like a, a, I don't even know, like a buckeye tree or something trying to kind of get through people coming in from Finland, Norway, Thailand of all places, United Kingdom, Germany, Ireland, Pakistan, Guatemala, Japan, but obviously a ton from the United States you know, when it comes to Brave the Wild and fan demographics and such. Can't thank you enough. Um, apparently, Iowa's number one, and I guess it makes sense because the Iowa Wild are obviously a huge fan base as well, and they follow Minnesota, so I think it's true, and that might be partially thanks to Purple Mafia because I know Iowa's number one for Purple Mafia, no doubt about it. It's a Minnesota Vikings show. Um, but thank you all so very much. Keep telling your friends about the show, spreading the word and all that. Um, and hope all of you have a wonderful week and the Wild continue to win. Uh, maybe maybe we sweep the Vegas Golden Knights and continue to go from there. Until next time, take care and God bless. Mm-hmm.